I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Newman is out. WeWork founder Adam Newman steps down as CEO with the company's IPO on the line. Now what? Plus, Google scores a win, a legal victory for Google Tuesday in the European Union courtroom. We'll have more on the right to be forgotten ruling. And more disruption, Lassian co-founder and co-CEO Mike Cannon-Brooks calls for more progressive-minded solutions to climate change using technology. But first, our top story, Adam Newman, the charismatic entrepreneur who led WeWork to become one of the world's most valuable startups, is stepping down as chief executive. He will take on a new role as non-executive chairman. The move is designed to salvage WeWork's planned initial public offering, which had been met with scorn from public investors. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg Technology Executive Editor Tom Giles. Tom, what was the reaction to this? Well, I think what this shows is that they are serious about salvaging the IPO. The sense that investors have is it's a sigh of relief. We saw it coming. Uh, this is something that SoftBank, the major shareholder in WeWork, had been pushing for for a long time. They told us also that the number two shareholder, by the way, Benchmark, was also behind it. So this is the kind of thing that really sends a signal to investors that, look, we're taking your concerns seriously. We understand that you have concerns about the CEO. He's, a very, he's been very out there. He's, you know, he has a reputation for being free spending. Um, they're a loss-making company. They're, they're, there were concerns about conflicts of interests, self-dealing, um, the role of his wife, Rebecca. So this is, a t this is an attempt to kind of rein in all of those things. He's going to have less sway over the board, going from 20 votes a share to three votes a share. Rebecca's stepping back from the company in terms of her involvement. He's obviously stepping down as CEO and is become, going to become a non-executive chairman. All of this says to shareholders, we hear you. We are concerned about the corporate governance issues that, were, that came from having him so central to this company. And even uh, to his credit, Adam Newman, in an, in an email that he sent to the company, we looked at that today, we got a copy of it and posted it on the terminal. And he talked about like, you know, I had become the center of the story and I really don't want that to be the case. We're at a good place. Um, and I really want that to be the focus for investors. What do we know about the two new temporary, for now, co-CEOs mm -hmm. who are taking over? Mm -hmm. These are people who you really think of, you know, the tech company needs the adult in the room, right? We mm -hmm. talk about that a lot with some of these companies. We talked about it a lot with Facebook when they brought in Sheryl Sandberg. And I think there are some similarities here. You really want someone with public company experience. You have somebody who came from Amazon. You have somebody who came from Time Warner Cable. So they've got experience at publicly traded companies at, and, and they, can, they can really send a signal to the shareholder community, which is what you have to be thinking about on the eve of an IPO, that we are going to, we know how to run a company under these circumstances. So does it go far enough? Is this enough to get that IPO? Great question. Uh, there's a question mark about exactly when this is going to take place. It had already kind of been put on, uh, put a little bit on a shelf until sometime in October. Now there's debate about whether even that can happen. Um, there is a clock ticking. It's very important that they get this done soon because they had financing lined up. There was, remember, uh, contingent upon the IPO, there was going to be an additional several billion dollars lined up in funding uh, from banks in association in association with the IPO. Now that that's on hold, there's a question mark about where that comes through. So we're really trying, we're getting with sources, we're going to be trying to break news right there on the terminal about exactly how that is going to come together. Well, I will let you get back to breaking that news on the terminal as the saga continues. That was Bloomberg's Tom Giles. Now, I want to stay with Newman's decision to step down and bring in Rhett Wallace of Triton Research. And over the phone, I'm joined again by Gene Munster of Loop Ventures. Gene, let me start with you and perhaps give you a victory lap because 12 hours before Newman stepped down, you spoke on this program and said he would become a non-executive chairman. You did not think that he would remain in charge. What's your reaction? 
Well, I think, you know, the writing was clearly on the wall that this uh, was where the momentum was. And so my reaction first is think of this in three chapters. There's the past and there's things that happened that were very good with WeWork. There were things around the leadership that were not as good. That leadership got, did a lot of the power that, that really built the company. Then there's the present, and I have to applaud uh, really everybody involved in just how smooth this is going so far. Is uh, If you look at the clock on this, it's just a few weeks ago that this really started. And they already have some uh, replacements, temporary or permanent. And uh, I think Adam, the way he stepped aside, uh, was uh, respectable and so uh, credit the company for that. That was different than how Uber's leadership changed. It took a lot of time to find uh, a replacement. I think that was what was most uh, surprising to me is kind of the pace that they're going here. And then there's the question about the future. And just to uh, kind of circle back and quickly talk about the timing of this IPO, I think that it is uh, unlikely uh, that anything happens uh, in that October frame because now equity investors are going to want to get a uh, handle, want the, the senior management to have a handle on the business, and that just simply takes time. If I was going to guess, I think it's probably early next year uh, if they want to uh, really maximize the valuation here. They could do something more quickly, but they would uh, uh, equity investors would would uh, factor that in with a lower, even lower valuation than what we've talked about. So uh, all in, good move for WeWork, but uh, I think we're still a ways away from an IPO. Red, I too could arguably give you a victory lap. You and I spoke in the last few months after you wrote a smart but scathing report on WeWork about their financials. What changed for you today with the announcement that Newman steps down? Well, so what we found ourselves saying about this situation is that WeWork suffered from three things that when put together are, are not good news for a company. The first was significant losses. The second was opacity. They made it very difficult to analyze the company. And then the third is really arrogance. And I think we're, there are a lot of things we could put in the bucket of arrogance, the related party transactions, the 20 votes per share, and, and sort of a number of things. And so the only thing that changed today is possibly the third bucket as far as arrogance. But for losses and for opacity, those two problems remain. And I think you know what's interesting, having watched this play out over the last couple of weeks, is among our customer group, which is you know long, short, and long only investors. You know, a month ago, I wasn't hearing anyone saying like Adam is the problem, and even a week ago, I wasn't hearing anyone saying Adam is the problem. So this is sort of a new solution, um, but I'm not sure it addresses some of the problems that people had most significantly about handing over three or four billion additional dollars to this company at the type of valuation they were looking for. Well, and Gene, I fold you back in here as an equity analyst. A corporate governance change doesn't change the top or the bottom line fundamentals and the fact that this company is losing tons of money. Is that still the biggest concern? I think uh, no, and I know that that is, isn't consensus thinking. I think that this business uh, is uh, it's a concern if investors don't know that. They understand that this uh, business has a ton of cash needs. And I think the leadership piece is really critical here because it sets the tone for, you just think about all the, the, the leaders of, of these tech companies, it's almost like the company's performance almost is embodied in the leader. Um, and so I think it's really critical. So I, I don't think that the cash burn is the critical issue for investors. I think they understand that. I think that if you want to think about upside to the story longer term, uh, clearly how they spend their money is going to be important and, and how they... Uh, scale this business, but I think uh, this. I think this is a little bit more meaningful if they can, um, you know, really kind of change some of that. I, I do want to catch myself as well. You know, when I talk about that change at the top, that is a really hard thing to do to change uh, the culture of a business to be more judicious, and that's why I think it's going to take longer to actually get public. Is there's going to be some teething, and the company will probably see some departures around this. Uh, before well, uh, I think the rank and power are comfortable. Right. Well, and Gene, talk to me about the big risk of removing that visionary leader, that big founder. We talked about Elon Musk, who is associated with Tesla, Mark Zuckerberg, associated with Facebook. You talk about Uber and their leadership changes. What's the risk that you remove Newman and the vision goes with it? It's probably the biggest risk. Uh, 
and uh, I mean that's the catch uh, in some way the catch 22 here is that he, there needed to be some change but it, the best ideal uh, so to answer your question is it is a material risk uh, culture is critical as an equity analyst I always focused on uh, uh, income statements and balance sheets as uh, a private investor as a venture capitalist the, the culture piece is even I, I realize that even with public companies it's absolutely critical and can't be overstated enough. It's it's going to be if I'm if I had the the hefty responsibility of stepping in in some capacity here, that would be my number one concern is not to lose the vision. Fred, I bring you in here as you and I have talked uh, a few times about the income statement and mm -hmm. what worries you most here about the margins, the bottom line, the way in which they're reclassifying expenses. What is your biggest risk as it comes down to the financials? Sure. I mean, I think that's really simple, which is just that the disclosure didn't really provide the unit economics to know whether the company makes money or how long it takes them to make money on the individual unit. I mean, if we were going to contrast this with, you know, Peloton, for example, Peloton disclosed just, you know, beautiful numbers as far as their customer acquisition costs, the long-term value of their, their subscribers, their, um, you know the the churn of their members so they made it really clear for investors to pencil out like what the unit economics were and we work didn't really do that so I think you know as you look at a transition I mean you know just quickly back on the CEO transition you know if if you were going to try to take this company public with the cash needs it has I would think that you would want to bring one of the most gifted fundraisers that we've seen you know in this cycle for sure with you right so additional cash needs you know that obviously you know has an impact on who your staff is. And so if this was just an operating story as opposed to a fundraising story, then it might be easier to think like, OK, you know, getting rid of the visionary founder is the right thing to do. But what we don't know, back to your question, is how much money it really takes from here forward. I mean, the IPO and the debt financing looked like it was going to be worth another nine or ten billion dollars. And so we don't know how much money it takes to get from here to the other side of a stable business that isn't losing in the neighborhood of two billion dollars a year. So I would say that was our biggest issue is just not understanding what the go forward cash needs really are. Gene, what is the number one single important point you need to hear from the new management? How they're going to uh, navigate the culture, and and uh, I mean, it, it sounds so subtle, but th their uh, success at that, you don't want to see uh, droves of people leaving, uh, or even worse, people stay and be disgruntled that their uh, inspirational leader has left. So it's just something around that, and and uh, you know, I, I agree with the point on Peloton too. This idea that we just need to be more investor friendly on on those those metrics, I absolutely agree. That would be, uh, I think, a go a long way. Ultimately, there's two chapters here uh, going forward. There's the IPO piece, which they can say some things that can get the IPO done, and then there's actually building value after that. And uh, that is going to be um, they're going to uh, investors are going to need a framework to think about that longer term, and that would be helpful to hear that framework sooner versus later. Brett, biggest issue you want to hear management address? I mean, that's such a tough one, right? Because, you know, this management team, obviously, they're very, they're very capable. But what you have is a growth story at this moment. That's the only way that you can sort of understand the valuation that, that this company gets versus the sort of comparables that are much lower multiple companies. So, so I think that you know, the company didn't have a culture problem the way that, for example, Uber had a culture problem. right? And Uber's culture problem was significant enough that the owners and directors of Uber felt like they needed to deal with that well in advance of a public offering. This isn't a company that had a problem like that. Like the, the culture was very much in intact and so I think that you know I'll agree with Gene that understanding how they're going to keep the culture intact is important but how do you rationalize the financials of a big money losing company but while also maintaining your growth story and keeping your team together is really what I think these this new co-CEO mm -hmm. duo has to articulate. Wonderful roundtable. Rhett Wallace of Trade and Research and Loop Ventures. Gene Munster thank you both for joining me. Coming up, Amazon will be unveiling new hardware products at its event in Seattle on Wednesday. How the company expects to further compete with Apple and Google next. This is Bloomberg.
Amazon is set to unveil new Alexa driven devices on Wednesday. The company hasn't said what products are coming, but Bloomberg has previously reported that Amazon is working on Alexa powered earbuds, a better sounding Echo smart speaker, a health tracker and a domestic robot. To discuss, I'm joined by Bloomberg Technologies, Mark Gurman. You have all the details. So of all those devices, which are analysts and investors most excited for? You know, that's a good question. I mean, the only one there that's a wholly new category that Amazon could really make a dent in would be the home robot. This is not something that I expect to sell in major quantities, but it would be a real demonstrable showing of, you know, Amazon's prowess in computer vision and robotics. They'd really be first to market with a modern R2-D2, uh, I think you could say, in the home. But it's, to me, the most interesting things are the headphones. So let's talk quickly about the robot before we move on to the headphones, because yeah. the robot to me felt like a way to differentiate themselves, because frankly, that's sort of a new product where Google and Apple haven't yet entered. Is that a way in which they're trying to keep up or compete with their competitors? Yeah, that's a good question. So this is something it's called Project Vesta. This has been in development for about three to four years now. It's unclear if they're going to actually show this tomorrow. When they started work on it, their goal was to ship by 2019. So that would be this year. But there actually have been a lot of delays in the project, people leaving, them moving the project around internally. Uh, the person running the project is probably going to retire in, in the near future. He's been working there for a long time. So it's to be seen if it'll be shown. But you know, to your question, this really is a way to show you know, their innovation at Amazon. Now, on the flip side of that, when we were at the Apple launch event a few weeks ago, it was all about you know, some earbuds and some you know, wireless devices. When you take a look at Amazon and their earbuds, what are you expecting? Is it the price point that gets you excited? No, I mean, the thing that makes me excited is the competition, right? I think the AirPods are one of the better products, better new initiatives that Apple has done in the past few years. And having a real competitor on the market, it, it could help Apple or push Apple to make their product even better. It also is going to drive prices down for consumers. Apple charges about 160 for its AirPods. Look for Amazon to come in at about $100. You know better than anyone the integration of hardware and software via health and the health tracker. We know that with the watch. How is Amazon trying to incorporate some of that health tracker into their hardware devices as well? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's it's twofold. One, there's this wrist-worn device code named Dylan uh, that my colleague Matt Day reported on earlier this year. This would be a, a wellness device similar to a, a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, but it would have a bigger focus on understanding uh, your emotions. And the headphones are also expected to have some health functionality and sensors built in as well. Any privacy concerns? You know, that, that's the big question with Amazon. It'll be really interesting to see if they have a segment in their announcement tomorrow about privacy. Wonderful. The Bloomberg Technologies, Mark Gurman, thank you for joining me on all things Amazon. And coming up, some would say that Facebook already exerts mind control over its users. Well, now the social network wants to help give your mind control over a computer. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Controlling your computer with your mind. Facebook is looking into it. The tech giant has agreed to buy CTRL Labs. It's a technology startup that is building software to let people control a digital avatar using only their thoughts. The technology uses a bracelet to measure neuron activity to determine movement a person is thinking about. To discuss, I'm joined by Bloomberg Technologies' Kurt Wagner. How does this work? Yeah, it's pretty futuristic sounding. It's uh, the idea being that when you think about moving your hands or your arms or whatever, you actually send some neural signals through your body to tell your muscles to move. And what Control Labs has done is they've taken a bracelet that can actually measure that neuron activity and translate that to actual movement on a computer screen. So if you're thinking about you know making uh, uh, five fingers with your hand instead of a fist, uh, even if you don't actually do it, if you're just thinking about doing it, you can actually control you know, a digital hand on the screen. The idea being that maybe someday you'd be able to have an avatar or something else that you could simply control with your mind. Okay, so fold this into what this means for Facebook. Yeah, so the company has uh, said that they want to build AR glasses, right? This is just one of, of many potential use cases, but I think it's probably the best one. So if you imagine a world in which you don't have a phone anymore, you just have these glasses on your face that serve as kind of your computer, your interface to the rest of the world, 
you need some way to control that, right? And it's not going to be a very attractive pair of glasses if there's a bunch of buttons on it or if there's a keyboard. So imagine, you know, controlling those, controlling the computer that you're wearing, but doing so with your mind. You don't necessarily need to have an actual physical controller uh, to, to control that. So you said it sounds pretty futuristic. Have we been given a timeline or has Facebook indicated when this could start to roll out? There is no timeline. Uh, we know that they've been working on something similar for a few years. Back in 2017, uh, they announced a computer brain interface is what it's called. And it sound, it's kind of just as spooky as, as it sounds. The idea being that you could uh, uh, think about words that you would want to say, and those would be translated into you know, text on the screen. So Facebook was working more on the, the text version of this, and now they've acquired a company that maybe does a little bit more of the physical movement version of this. But in either case, the idea is can you, you know, translate your thoughts to a computer without having to have any invasive wires or, or any, you know, controls to do that? What does this mean for the future integration of hardware and software within Facebook? I mean, it's pretty... Uh, limitless in, in some ways, right? I mean, the idea that if this actually works and if you can control what happens on a computer uh, screen or a software program without you know, having to do anything but think about it, there's a lot of opportunities there. Uh, I mentioned the AR glasses as being one. I think Facebook would love to be in the next wave of hardware. Whatever the next thing is after the phone, Facebook wants to be there. You know, they missed out on, on the smartphone. Uh, Apple and Google own the operating system. Facebook is kind of dependent on them in some ways. So whatever comes next, they want to be there. So I think for them, that's probably the biggest opportunity. But I mean, there, there's really no uh, limit in terms of what this could become. If there's no limit on what it could become, that means there has to be other competitors entering this space. Do sure. we have any indication what other competitors are out there? Well, we've talked a lot about the, the big tech companies and building AR, uh, augmented reality. So, you know, Microsoft is one, Google. These are companies that are that are that certainly have the uh, budgets and the talent in terms of engineers to work on this kind of stuff. So uh, even the, the startup that Facebook just bought, Control Labs, it had investment from Amazon's Alexa fund. It had investment from GV, uh, you know, formerly Google Ventures. So there were other tech companies that had identified this technology as being of interest. So Facebook may have acquired them, but they're not the only company uh, that's thinking about this. We will title today's segment a futuristic Facebook. Yes. Kurt Wagner, thank you, from Bloomberg. And coming up, Google gets a court win in Europe. Why the EU sided with the court giant over the right to be forgotten online. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. Google scored a big win in the European Union court on Tuesday, this case centering around whether users have a, quote, right to be forgotten online. The court said search engines should remove results on the European versions of its websites, but are not required to scrub links globally. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo filed this report from Brussels. It was a victory for Google at the European Court of Justice. This is, of course, the highest court in Europe, which agreed with the company there is no such thing as a global right to be forgotten. And this goes back to a French regulator, which suggested that individuals do have a right to get information removed from the web if it's out of date, perhaps old, perhaps detrimental to their reputation. Now, today, the court agreed with Google this should only be restricted to Europe, and they should not change the way they operate globally. It was a victory for for Google. They have said many times they did not want to be a referee between the right to a personal private life, but also the right to access information freely and openly on the web. They also raised concerns about potential censorship if this right to be forgotten was misused. Overall, a victory for Google in court, but also many of the groups that had campaigned in favor of freedom of speech online. In Brussels, Maria Tadeo, Bloomberg News. 
And now to discuss further, Bloomberg Technologies' Mark Bergen, who covers Alphabet. So I first have to ask, how much of a win is this for Google? I mean, this is an issue that's been they've been working on for a long time, and it clearly shows that even despite the problems they've had in Europe around antitrust and now the pressure they're having in the U.S., um, Google has a lot of political muscle and capital um, and can pick up these big wins. Uh, I think it was interesting, as Maria said in, in the report at the end, they've talked about a lot about the issue here with uh, moving into more authoritarian regimes and the dangers where the, they could just scrub Google search results and effectively scrub the internet. Uh, and Google has clearly, you know, earlier this last year, there were reports about their looking to go back into China. Uh, they've been working in Saudi Arabia and Egypt and a lot of these countries where they have this very difficult uh, legal and policy dilemma, uh, and so this is a big win for them uh, in, in those markets. Well, and it's funny that you mention the EU, because we often don't talk about Google winning privacy laws in the EU, because they've arguably been much stricter than the U.S. when it comes to some of those laws. What does this mean for the EU and Google's expansion there? Yeah, I mean, they've been, they've been on the back feet for a while, especially with antitrust and then the GDPR with the, the privacy law that was passed um, last year. I know there are people, they're both sides of this issue, right? Google clearly, GDPR has affected their advertising business, but at the same time, uh, companies like Google and Facebook have enough legal resources and financial resources to deal with these privacy, uh, you know, just basically have enough lawyers to throw at it in a way that a lot of startups um, haven't been able to do. Uh, and so, it, and, you know, the people have made the argument that this sort of solidifies uh, Google's position, at least in their primary market, which is online advertising. By not scrubbing some of that data outside of the EU, any impact on the company's financials? As you mentioned, advertising big on the top and the bottom line. Any sense of what this means for Google? Yeah, I mean, this has largely been an issue that's not necessarily tied to their search advertising business. Um, but I think you can kind of read it as if you, if you have this balance between privacy and uh, freedom of expression, and Google here saying this is a case where this is a freedom of expression should win out. You know, we should people should be able able to, you know, people, or rich people or, comp or uh, government shouldn't be able to just scrub results from the internet. Uh, in this case, they won, and, and that looks like, you know, when they're going into future privacy battles, which do have big implications for their business, um, they can point to this sort of victory and use that momentum. Is there any read through that we could take to laws here in the U.S.? As we know, privacy, antitrust, sort of just starting really to heat up in the U.S. Any read through from that over here? Uh, so what's happening, uh, coming up in a few months, is California's privacy bill, um, you know, critics have called it uh overly like stringent along with the in line with Europe um, there's repercussions there that would have sort of domino effect and, and um, move on to different states uh, clearly the privacy advocates say this is long overdue um, and it puts pressure on companies like Google and Facebook um, that have been operating that these uh, data hoarding businesses for a very long time um, Google's talked a lot about changing their business right and and putting in a lot more privacy controls there's certainly this pressure that that's not going away and we'll see um, a lot more of that with the California California bill. You also, we can fold this into another story that we've been tracking about Alphabet and Google today, where they were the only member of the World Wide Web Consortium to vote against a measure that would expand the power of an internet privacy group. Walk me through that. Yeah, it's kind of wonky stuff, but this is uh, this this body of organizations that have a lot of privacy groups, so like, you know, Apple, um, Safari, uh, Firefox, Google, but a lot of the companies that basically uh, build the backbone for the internet and are involved. Um, and they have this convening and they set a lot of the rules um, where effectively if, you know, if a, if a website does, decides for some reason not to follow these rules, like they're, they're not going to be able to operate on the web. Uh, and my colleague Garrett did a great story about how they had this uh, proposal around privacy and the one company in that consortium that voted against it was Google. Uh, and this is just pinpoints the fact that Google has had this tension here where they've been, they've been you know, talking a lot about privacy, they've been taking certain steps, but their primary business depends on online advertising and a certain big portion of their business depends on you know, the web cookies, uh, these things that Apple and a lot of other browsers have outlawed third-party cookies. Google chose not to do that. It's certainly critical for their, their business going forward. Wonky, but smart. That was Bloomberg's Mark Bergen. Thank you for joining me. Coming up, we'll hear how Atlassian is making a commitment to fight climate change. Our conversation with co-CEO Mike Cannon-Brooks. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
time now for a look at some of the top tech movers. Snap, the parent company of Snapchat, was upgraded to a buy from neutral at Guggenheim, who also established a street high price target of $22 on Snap. Snap has more than tripled off a December low, jumping more than 200%. And that's in stark contrast to Netflix, which has fallen for a fifth straight session. This comes as the streaming service is facing increased competition from new rivals such as Apple and Disney, both launching their respective services soon. With the five-day slump, Netflix has shed nearly 30% of its value so far this quarter. That puts it on track for its biggest three-month slump since 2012. And Alphabet is feeling the love from RBC thanks to Google Maps. Analyst Mark Mahaney says Google Maps is one of the greatest under and unmonetized platforms. Mahaney added that Maps could generate up to $3.6 billion in incremental revenue by 2021. Now, Australian tech entrepreneur Mike Cannon Brooks is using his platform to fight climate change. The co founder and co CEO of enterprise software company Atlassian sat down with Bloomberg's Ed Hammond to discuss climate, tech, and why the future needs to be ready for more disruption. We have a very um complicated business sector when it comes to this, right? Because in finance and insurance and lots of other areas, Australia is actually very progressive on this stuff and very worried about climate change and moving forward. Um, even in the mining sector, um, like I'm incredibly pro-mining. If you look at the opportunities for Australia, right? In a green world, what are we gonna make? Panels, batteries, all these sort of things. What do we make? Rare earth minerals, lithium, nickel, copper. We have just a phenomenal amount of opportunities before you get to sun and wind in mining. That doesn't mean that the fossil fuel parts of mining that are incompatible with a future climate, we, we, we don't have to transition out of and, and put together plans to transition out of. Uh, I just want to pick on this. You talked about batteries. Obviously, you famously had this bet that you lost with Elon Musk uh, a couple of years ago where uh, he said he could build a battery of a certain size in 100 days. You said he couldn't, and he did. Um, he's obviously a sort of standard bearer of sorts for this uh, push to be more green and more environmentally friendly for the long term. Um, and, and is representative of a lot of sort of people in the tech industry who are making these claims about where we should be heading. Is there a problem that people like Mr. Musk are sort of so uh, aloof and, and kind of otherworldly that perhaps it's hard for the average person to relate to them and say this is something we should be on board with? Sure. Look, I think um, in Australia we have some phenomenal examples of, again, where there should be an opportunity. So I absolutely agree. It, it can be hard to connect to Elon. He's, he's a, awesome character but you know um, he's not uh, your regular guy uh, uh, nor should he be he's amazing for humanity right but but you have to have both regular connectivity and, and all sorts of parts of society um, Australia we have some really interesting examples of this right so we have the highest penetration of household solar in the world more people sleep per capita under a solar panel in Australia than anywhere else right so that's an army that's a, that's a movement that can be moved. If you're sleeping under a solar panel, you understand this. Um, and when it comes to batteries, it's even more crazy. We have more batteries in Australia, full stop, residentially, than anywhere else in the world, right? Than the rest of the world put together. More residential batteries, right? So we have this engaged population that understand these, these issues already in Australia. We've just got to get that aligned with, uh, you know, with stable government policy. Another area where you've been very strong with the government is saying that they need to do much more to position the country and the business sector, particularly for the sort of uh, the wave of technology that is going to come and disrupt not just tech and retail and some of the more sort of obvious industries, but in your mind, every industry eventually mm -hmm. is going to be a tech industry. Uh, are they doing enough? Um, look, we're working really well with the government on this area and, and trying to push forward. Obviously, we need um, Again, sensible policy, sensible settings on technology and technological issues. And these are complex topics of encryption and uh, uh, violent material and all sorts of other things. But we still need to be very engaged and to move that stuff forward so that it's a sensible place. Um, and secondly, we need to have a viable um, both tech industry and tech enabled every other industry in Australia. Right? A simple stat I'd like to give is we're 1% of the world's GDP. If we're not 1% of the world's technology production, then we're going to be in trouble as an economy, right? As the economy moves more towards technology as a broad, it's the biggest industry in the world already, it's only getting bigger. We have to be producing some technology in Australia. It doesn't have to be all of it, but you'd argue we have to produce 1% of the world's technology to be 1% of the world's GDP. Um, and we need to you know, keep 
keep moving the economy forward such that that's the case and that's education, it's immigration, it's sensible uh, uh, policy settings in, in all types of areas. Well, immigration, interesting as you mentioned, because immigration obviously is a huge part of what allows some countries to be more successful at technology than others because the tech worth, workforce, as we know, is entirely transient and will go where they feel the best opportunities are, the most interesting companies are. So uh, what does a country like Australia have to do to attract that workforce uh, to such an extent that it can be at that 1% level or higher for, um, for producing tech GDP? Yeah, I mean, I think we, we're doing a relatively good job recently. We've had some, some big changes in the last couple of years on immigration as it relates to the tech industry, um, which is actually in, in pretty good spot, can always be a bit better, but like, to be fair, over the last couple of years, it's, it's in a really good spot. Um, I think, uh, most of the policy settings are pretty sane around, you know, you must invest in education and local. And the way that we think about it at, at Atlassian is very simple, is that we need to invest in the talent coming up from the, from the, from the bottom, right? So uh, high school and then tertiary education. We need to have lots of graduates. We have lots of talent in Australia, that's not the problem. What we don't have is lots of experience. So the higher up the company you get, the more we don't have a lot of people in Australia with 10 years worth of technology experience. So we have to import those and then we make sure internally that when we import say half of a, a, a level or an area, um, the half that we import are helping the other half and all of the graduates and everyone else to up level. Um, and that's how we grow the economy. Hopefully that talent stays in Australia. You know, uh, it's a great lifestyle. It's a great place to live. Um, there's a lot of sensible jobs. The economy is obviously doing uh, uh, pretty well if you look over a sort of three decades uh, period. So, you know, we're hopeful if we can get that um, sort of talented individual into the country, they'll, they'll stay and, and long term contribute to the economy. That was Atlassian co-CEO Mike Cannon Brooks speaking to Bloomberg's Ed Hadmond. Now, e-cigarette company Juul is cutting its workforce. The company plans to restructure jobs and eliminate some positions. That's according to a person familiar with the matter. The San Francisco-based startup employs 3,900 people after a rapid expansion. Juul is currently under scrutiny by federal and state officials following reports of a mysterious illness related to vaping and a proposed ban on flavored e-cigarettes. Now still ahead, transforming B2B payments, a startup called Funbox wants businesses to transact with each other without having to know counterparty risk. We'll meet the CEO next. This is Bloomberg. B2B payments and credit platform Fundbox has raised $176 million from global investors in a Series C funding round. It also secured a $150 million credit facility from institutional credit investors. The company is part of a growing scene of startups that want to lend to small business customers and its banking on artificial intelligence to do just that. San Francisco-based Fundbox has confirmed the latest round does give it a valuation between $500 million and $1 billion. Uh, they did not yet disclose an exact number. Joining me to discuss all of this, Funbox CEO Ayal Shinar. Thank you for joining me. Congratulations on the funding round. Walk me through what you want to use the money for. Thank you for having me. Uh, always good to be here. Um, I think the main thing is just to play an offense, meaning we hit few milestones and we confirm the thesis that this is a big market that we can actually make a difference, which hopefully I'm going to touch a little bit later on how we do that. And now it's uh, time to establish ourselves as a market leader before competition is starting to uh, drag into this space. Well, tell me, how are you planning to make a difference? So we're helping businesses, whether medium-sized, small, in some cases even larger businesses, to get paid on a transaction with another business almost instantly. And what it does, it basically eliminates the need of waiting for the net terms to be 30, 60 days, which is a typical way that the B2B transaction is done today. So instead of waiting for 30, 60, or 90 days, once you sell to another business, if you're using Funbox, you're getting paid almost instantly, and your buyer has uh, still remained the flexible terms, and in addition to those terms, they have the option, not the obligation, to after finance it over time, after the terms are over. How do you differentiate who your target customer is? We focus on businesses that are B2B and usually have a lag between the time they incur the cash cost 
of a purchase order uh, until the time they're getting paid. So that would be, you, you name it, could be a forklift uh, you know, manufacturer, it could be a furniture manufacturer, any business really that's selling to another business doesn't benefit from the credit card network and the instant payment it involves. So while you see a lot of innovation on the B2C payment and credit side, which uh, has been going on for the last 60 years of innovation, which turned into a very efficient ecosystem, the B2B stayed in the 1950s. And they kind of counting on paper checks and ACH transfer to get paid after those 30 or 60 days transfer. You had an equity raise, and it was also very interesting about this, was a credit facility or a loan, sort of a, 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 the debt perspective of this all. As a CEO, do you accept all money? How did you differentiate between both credit and equity? Equity is basically what we're going to use to spend on marketing, hire more employees. We have many new roles that we need to fill both in San Francisco, Dallas, and our Tel Aviv R&D center. And that's what we use the equity for. The, the credit part is more for the actual advances, actual payments that we push to the merchants. Um, and when it comes to choosing your investor base, in my mind, it's A, do you have that option to choose? Because now we have good times where money is almost commodity. So you have a lot of uh, investors trying to, you know, to invest money into companies. But in three months or three years, that can change. So first question, do you have the option to choose your investor base? And if the answer is not, just take the money. <laughs> just take the money. <laughs> we were fortunate enough to have the, you know, to be in a time and, and very strong business uh, metrics to actually choose our investors that can add strategic value and facilitate the next three years for the business, uh, whether it's new products or international growth. Well, I want to speak to one of those investors next. Thank you. That was Funbox CEO Ayal Shinar. And now I want to go on the phone because Coastal Ventures partner David Wyden is standing by. He did participate in the latest funding round of this company. So, David, thank you for joining me. As you take a look at the landscape on where you can put your money, why Funbox? So what we liked about Funbox, and by the way, we co-led the round, and so we were uh, quite enthusiastic about the company, even though we've been involved for five years, we see the business accelerating. And we think that is driven by now they've achieved what we call product market fit, which to us means they have many customers that like the service they're getting from Funbox. And we think that now their biggest days are ahead of them because the small business market is so big that once they've perfected the product, now it's time to scale. So, David, how important is it now as an investor that you can clearly see a path to profitability? Oh, I think it's quite important. <laughs> and I think uh, some other startup struggles we see in the headlines underscores that having a, a sound business that is uh, profitable with its current customers and if it's losing money it really should just be because it's investing in growth and part of what we like about Funbox is it fits those parameters the current business with the current customers is already profitable and then the reason for investment is to scale further with new customers well and David when we talk about a lot of the other struggles in the marketplace right now some of that also comes down to valuation. How do you make sure in your analysis in the private market that the valuation you see lines up with an eventual public market valuation? That's a great question. And that the valuation is driven both by investors and by the management team. And I find the Fundbox's management team is, is quite good but willing to be relatively understated. And so I think they made a conscious choice, even though they could have raised money at a higher valuation, that that would be, might feel good in the short term, but wasn't the right long-term way to build value. So every round this company's done is, the expression is left something on the table. And I think, in my experience, that's the best way to build value over time. And I think we're seeing other companies that have learned that lesson the hard way. David, it's very interesting when we take a look at the funding round, both on the equity side and then the credit side. I believe you were an equity investor. Are you nervous about a credit line that may, in a priority, come in above an equity investor? That's a good question. I would say 
with first of all for this kind of business it's just a, it's just a part of doing the business so i think i i would say we at a high level are comfortable with that it's just uh it's an aspect of this business part of the reason we're comfortable of it with funbox in particular is because both of how they've brought technology to bear and we can see the results of the success of their technology in building lending and credit models such that we think funbox even in adverse market conditions is an attractive place to extend credit rather than an unattractive place. And in a recession or in bad market conditions, what we believe happens is there's a separation between poor credit underwriting and excellent credit underwriting. So while I'm not hoping for a recession, I think Fundbox would be well-suited and well-positioned in a recession if and when that occurs. David, quickly here, preferred exit path IPO? Uh, yes, and w the part of the inspiration I have in saying yes to that is we've been fortunate to be the lead investor in two other companies focused on helping small businesses. One is Square and one is Ring Central, that mm -hmm. both have gone public and they're both valued at approximately 10 times uh -huh. where they were when they went public. David, I'm going to have to leave it there. Thank you. That was David Wyden of Coastal Ventures. Thank you for joining me. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We're live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology. Be sure to follow our global breaking news network. This is Bloomberg.